Welcome to the 58th BizHack Live. We launched this during COVID, and today is the end of our third season of free community webinars uh, dedicated to helping small businesses survive and thrive uh, during one of the worst uh, outbreaks of a virus we've ever seen. And uh, it's been such an honor to, to put these together and to uh, work with the amazing team. I wanted to acknowledge all the work uh, that Lilia Posos has done uh, to make these uh, into a reality. I'm so grateful to you and, and for the work that you've done. Um, and this series has been recognized by the American Marketing Association as a global campaign of the year. Um, and it's just such an honor to be able to do this kind of work to support now more than 2,000 small businesses that have been through the program. And also to raise uh, awareness of some of the amazing marketing talent like Jessica Valletri, who's gonna be presenting today. The, the idea behind this series has been to empower businesses with a simpler way to grow and to introduce them to the technology and the knowledge that they'll need to do that. Today, we're gonna to take some of the tricks from the Fortune 500 and we're going to show how small businesses can use those. Um, this is a, a challenging topic for a lot of small businesses, which is data. Um, and so we're going to take it slow. We're going to ask lots of questions. We're going to um, really uh, make sure that you guys come away with a deeper understanding of what data is out there and how you can leverage it for your own business. I wanted to ask you guys, we are right now formulating what season four of BizHack is going to look like. Uh, this is going to be uh, launching in the fall. And it's going to be different than what it's been before. The moment has changed. The needs have changed. And we want to be responsive to it. And so we are asking those of you, if you found value in this, if you um, want to uh, be a part of shaping the future of BizHack Live, please take our uh, five-minute survey where we ask you about your experience, what you valued out of it, and what you'd like to see us do next. Uh, and we will be giving a uh, Amazon gift card to one of the folks uh, who fill out the survey as a thank you for taking the time. So please, uh, we'll put the link uh, in, the, in the chat. Please go ahead. It's just a few minutes. You can do it while you're uh, on the call now. Uh, and please let us know how we can uh, do better in season four. I wanted to acknowledge the folks who've made this season possible, South Florida Integrate, Integrated Marketing Association, in, um, the American Marketing Association of South Florida, Creation Station, uh, which is a Broward-based uh, co-working space, CIC, which is in Miami, and the 10,000 Small Business Program, uh, of which I'm a instructor and also an alumnus. Now, I wanted to tell those of you who are new to BizHack a little bit about how we help businesses. We've created uh, something called the Lead Building System, which is a simpler way of digit, uh, understanding digital marketing. It's the foundation, your business story, the six pillars, and the nine steps. And this is the core of our curriculum, and we then teach it across lots of different platforms. Uh, we have on August 30th, uh, a deep dive into Facebook advertising, which we call the Facebook Marketer's Edge. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to introduce you to a very exciting new development we're debuting a new course, uh, particularly for uh, B2B marketers uh, on LinkedIn marketing, uh, led by the amazing Cheryl Cattell. This is an accelerated five-week program, and it'll show you uh, specifically how to leverage free uh, organic opportunities inside of LinkedIn to generate leads and grow your business. It's going to be an amazing course. We're hard at work at building it right now. I did want to encourage you guys, uh, this is really an interactive session, so uh, really wanted to encourage you to use the Q&A, please, um, which is the button uh, at the bottom where it says Q&A. Um, you can also put questions in the chat, but we'll be keeping an eye most closely on the Q&A. And without further ado, I wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, Jessica. And Jessica, I, what, one of the things I wanted to do in this introduction is not only talk about your background, but also talk about your technology. And honestly, I read the description of your technology and I didn't understand it. And so if I didn't understand it, people on the call won't understand it. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through the description and have you explain it in English. 
Would love to. Okay. <laughs> and then you'll do your presentation. But yeah. I want to understand, you know, you're a small business, you're a growing business, you've developed proprietary technology, mm -hmm. you're probably very proud of it. Um, it uses terminology that might make sense to a large company, but it doesn't make sense to a small business. But the ideas behind it are important for us to understand because it'll give us context for your presentation. Mm -hmm. So Jessica is uh, the founder of Track Data, uh, a direct to consumer data analytics and marketing firm. Um, she's been running the business since 2019. Um, so relatively young business. Uh, really interested in hearing a little bit about the origin of how the business came about from your work, uh, a decade of leading data analytics and marketing uh, businesses. You've all, your company, Track Data, helps agencies and direct marketers leverage both first party data, which is data that they collect themselves, and third party data, which is data that they acquire. Um, and then prior to Track Data, you would work in consumer data and analytics for clients such as Tide, Netflix, and HR and R Block. So this is the Track R technology, and this is how you described it in your bio. This is a proprietary technology that automates predictive modeling, prospect list generation, and profiling so that any D to C business can efficiently leverage third-party data to improve their sales and marketing. So let's unpack this. Um, let's talk about what so proprietary, proprietary technology means a technology that you developed that's mm -hmm. sort of unique to you and in order to access it, uh, only they can, that automates predictive modeling, prospect list generation, and profiling. So there are three things that it does. Let's start with predictive modeling. What is that? Love that. And first of all, thank you for calling um, Mio and Traco in our, our desperate need to better describe this for, for everyone. Um, and we actually are about to, on July 1st, so you hit me just in time, um, do a massive rebrand of our website because one of the reasons we did create this proprietary tech is so that businesses of all sizes can leverage the same type of targeting analytics that again, the Fortune 500 clients in our end are leveraging. And the only way to do so in an efficient way is to automate it. Um, because before automation, everything is slow, takes longer, costs more. So it's fairly prohibitive for, for a small business to access. Um, by automating it, and to your question on predictive modeling, it allows this um, AI-driven technology. So I don't want to add more words, um, but artificial intelligence, which is a word that's very popular right now uh, in the data industry, it essentially just means it, it builds and learns on its own. Um, it can build predictive models that then tell our clients, these are the absolute best 10,000, 100,000, 1 million prospects to go after. So it's instead of us manually choosing who, which prospects are best, um, again, based on our gut or based on who we think our clients are, um, a predictive model will statistically tell us who are the absolute best based on science um, and math. Okay, let me let me um, let me understand that. So, there is um, two types, I guess, of predictive, and I was thinking of a different type of predictive. Predictive um, sometimes refers to I'm an individual. Mm -hmm. I do these things in the past. Technology can then predict what I'm going to do in the future. Um, Netflix is a great example of this, mm -hmm. right? You were you worked with Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, I've watched this in the past. They can then predict what I'd like to watch in the future. What you're describing, though, sounds something different. What you're describing says, we're going to look at who your customers were in the past, and then we're going to predict who your customers might be in the future. Is that correct? That's correct. But you could also look at it on an individual level, because that, that's a part of it, too. So to what you're talking about, you can say, here is Jessica. And Jessica is the, the best possible customer for this brand. Jessica's done X, Y, and Z things in her past. She's um, done the, these behaviors, she's bought these products, she looks like this demographically, historically. Um, let's predict if we can find people who look just like her. So I want to find the hundred more Jessicas based on her, the data about me. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So this sounds a lot like the similar to in Google or the lookalike mm -hmm. or the match audiences in LinkedIn, mm -hmm. like, the, you, you know, this is, you know, one set of customers um, let's find another set of customers that are similar to or look alike them. Is that? that that's perfect. So it's essentially okay. a look alike model um, just on steroids. It's, it's leveraging much more data um, than a traditional one. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. Right, because Google and Facebook, you know, they do acquire third-party data, and then they're leveraging their pretty significant data store. Uh, but you guys um, basically have uh, taken that and put it on steroids. Okay, prospect list generation. What does that mean? That means, again, I'm a, um, let's say, an online furniture retailer, and I want to find prospects to, to send them to my site to have them hopefully convert and buy more products from me. Um, I need to generate a list of prospects. So typically it's a list of first name, last name, um, consumers or prospects who are most likely to again, engage and respond. This is slightly different, I'll say, than when you go into Facebook and you create a target audience within Facebook. That's a prospect list, yes. Um, This is different. What we're gonna talk about here is a bit different in that it's created offline. So it's uh, people are identified. So it's not anonymous, like within the Facebook platform, you know, you know, it's Jessica Valetri Akinwali at 100 Main Street, uh, Chicago, and she's 35 and has two kids and makes this much amount of money. um, And so on and so forth, thousands of data points tied to each person. um, And that's the prospect list that you would have access to. Got it. So when you're prospect listing in for instance, um, Facebook, the the data about who the people you're targeting is not um, made clear to you. Whereas in this case, or for instance, if you're retargeting people who visit your website, um, you don't know their identities. Mm-hmm. You, all you know is their behavior, which is they visited your website, they clicked on your video, they w- you know, and that's what retargeting in, inside of Facebook and Google looks mm-hmm. like. What you're saying is, no, no, we actually are going to create you a list of names and identities and contact information and then uh, leverage that. So, so that is also significantly more than what the kind of Google and Facebook and LinkedIn platforms tend to offer. It's a little closer to what LinkedIn offers in the sales navigator kind of function. Exactly. And the benefit here is you can still match it to Facebook. So you can take that list that's generated in third party data, that prospect list and and match it to Facebook to run a campaign to those people on Facebook or or match it to Google uh, to run a desk or display campaign. The difference is though, you'll know the people who have been exposed. So especially if you're selling direct to consumer, you can then very easily um, run attribution uh, programs afterwards or, or measure results because you have a matchback file. You know, Jessica was exposed to an ad. I hit her on Facebook. I sent her a direct mail piece. I ran dis- desktop display to her um, and she went to my website and she bought the product. So, so you know exactly who you're exposing to your advertising and exactly and if they purchase or not. Got it. So this is kind of the Shangri-La of, of digital marketing, right? Because you you are able to trace like individuals through the customer journey and then figure out which ones converted and then create um, lookalike audiences that are similar to that group. Exactly right. And I'm going to go slightly off topic here for 30 seconds, but you raised something interesting that even I was, was blown away when I first heard this. And, and it's very prevalent now among the Fortune 1000 companies, but, but expanding quickly is you mentioned retargeting online. So someone goes to a website, you follow them around with cookies uh, and by other methodologies. It's anonymous, but it's effective um, because you're still following that person, even if you don't know who they are. What we're doing now, um, us and other companies, are we can um, put a bit of JavaScript or a pixel on, on a client's website. So again, let's say I'm a furniture retailer selling online direct to consumers. I'm gonna put some little code on their website to capture visitor identification. So even if you don't give that brand your email, if you don't give that brand your mobile number, you don't sign up for their newsletters, you don't make a purchase, you do nothing, you just view the site, we can actually capture your your device IDs um, and other information about you and match it back to a name and address for retargeting to that specific person. Um, So again, if I go to furniture retailer website, furniture retailer will know Jessica Valetri Akinwali went to their site Here's what Jessica looks like. Again, here are all the demographic data points on her. Um, see if she's worth it or not to retarget and then go after her. So I just found that that, that level of data that's now available um, and whether or not you specifically give it to a company is just, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, 
Well, the, I hope this guy is, is inspiring some questions, um, which you're welcome to put in the chat. Um, I just wanted to make sure we talk about the third pillar of what you offer, which is profiling. Um, and then uh, I know you have uh, prepared a, a presentation for us, which uh, kind of gives us how to kind of take this cutting edge, state of the art, what the Fortune 1000 are only able really to afford to do, and then bringing it down to the ground level of the majority of businesses in this country, which are, are small and resource constrained. Uh, but talk about profiling. What does that mean? Yeah, and we'll actually talk about this too in the deck because I think it's so important and it's very accessible, affordable for small businesses to do. And that is matching your current customer list to this data that's available out there. And what, what that does is it gives you a snapshot as to what your customers actually look like. Um, again, you know, you, you know Jessica Valletri is a customer because I bought something from you, but, but who actually am I? Um, and what this will do is it will summarize um, for the company, what, what the demographic makeup is of their customers. Are they mostly female? Are they mostly older, younger? Do they mostly make 50,000 or $200,000 a year? Um, do they have kids and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that data, again, as we'll discuss in this deck, um, is just so valuable, both from a messaging perspective for the company to know who their customers are, uh, but also from a targeting perspective for marketing. Great. So, okay. So you have this proprietary technology, you use automation, mm -hmm. and it helps you with predictive modeling, right? Figuring out who your lookalike customers would be. Prospect list generation, knowing who they are, mm -hmm. um, down to their name, address, email, uh, and then profiling um, so that you have a really clear picture uh, of them for any direct to consumer D to C business. Um, so just so we are all familiar with what that means, you specifically cater to D to C or direct to consumer. What does that mean? Direct to consumer just means that it's a company who's selling hence the name, directly to a consumer. So there's no middleman, there's no retailer. It's again, um, article, online furniture retailer selling directly to consumers or um, the Dollar Shave Club selling razors and uh, care items directly to consumers. So not through Walmart, not through Amazon, not through another third party. This business is selling direct to consumers. Is there a difference between D to C and e-commerce? Um, I. In theory, yes, because an e-commerce site could sell multiple different brands, uh, company or multiple different brands, yes. This is specifically for, um, I, I think I have an example here in the deck, but let's say Life Extension. Again, they're out of Florida. They sell vitamins and nutraceutical products direct to consumers. They have their own branded e-commerce website. So I want a Life Extension product. I go directly to lifeextension.com and buy it right from the manufacturer or the brand. Now, a lot of the businesses that I work with during COVID went from being often like B2B or selling through intermediaries to also having a D2C or direct-to-consumer component to their business. You know, one of the examples, my favorite examples is a gluten-free bagel company mm -hmm. who, um, you know, when, when all the, um, you know, the delis were shut down, you know, and they couldn't sell their bagels there anymore, they started... People started out, people still wanted their bagels and they're gluten free. So they're a special kind of bagel and theirs tasted really good. So, what they found is people would look at their packaging, Google them, go to their website, and their e commerce component exploded as a result. And being ready to do that and being able to kind of spin that flywheel so that it went faster was a whole challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, I guess, an example of a direct to consumer uh, business line. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so last question I'll ask before I let you present is, uh, or before you present is, let you present, is um, are you seeing that a lot of businesses are adding direct to consumer lines and then coming to you to help with that launch? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's really out of two opportunities. One, as you mentioned, um, they were unable to sell during COVID. They were selling through retailers that had been shut down. So it was an opportunity and a necessity for them to start selling direct to consumer. And for that bagel example, I mean, what a the opportunity for them now because they now own their customer data. And I think brands um, don't yet take into account how valuable that first party data or their customer data is and, and how much you can do with it. And, and we'll get to that again. Um, the other half of um, growth with direct to consumer with COVID, again, as a result of COVID, 
has been with companies who, um, who big companies, again, I'll go back to furniture retailers because furniture has just been selling out um, since, since COVID started everywhere, where they found an opportunity to, again, start selling direct to consumer. Whereas before, some brands we work with just sold through retailers. So you could just go and buy it physically in a, in a store um, and not their own storefronts. They found an opportunity to very quickly go national, um, go online and sell again directly to, to the buyer. Perfect. All right. Well, I think we're set up very nicely now to kind of have a understanding of what your technology is and what it does. It's kind of breathtaking, frankly, that this is even possible. Um, it's also a little chilling. Uh, and I would welcome questions if anybody had any questions related to privacy or anything like that. Um, you know, this is a chance for you to talk to someone who works right on the edge uh, of the cutting edge, I should say, of um, you know, personal data um, and aggregating a lot of data uh, to help brands market. So this is an amazing opportunity to, to ask those questions as well. Uh, so uh, handing it over to you, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. We should have time uh, at the end for questions. Perfect. Um, yes, it's not a long presentation, just not for everyone with me um, talking for 40 minutes. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen here? Yes, we can. Perfect. So let me skip forward to get a bit. Um, you, thank you, did a great job of introducing me. Again, my background's all been data, data targeting analytics. So uh, working with data scientists, again, to improve um, modeling uh, and consumer data. So we, um, and thank you, Dan, you helped um, define a lot of these very important terms at the start. But again, just to, to go through them one more time, because there's two terms here that I think will be very important for the rest of this. Um, again, a direct to consumer business, someone selling directly to their, their customers or the end buyer. An example here is life extension. I want to buy one of their products. I go to the life extension site and I buy directly from them. Um, other examples are again, financial services like H&R Block, um, Belt Home, hearing aids uh, to seniors, um, Casper mattresses, Article, the furniture retailer I was talking about. Um, so beyond the fact that all of these very, very different industries, very different categories of businesses are all direct to consumer. Another thing they have in common and this is a really key point here, is the fact that they know who their customers are. So this is an example of a customer file um, that any one of those companies I mentioned would have, because again, clients are buying directly from them, uh, whether that's in their physical storefronts or online. You can see here, uh, I'm a client of this, this company, John Smith is a client. So they know John Smith's a client or a customer, but, but who is John Smith beyond knowing his address? We, we really don't know who he is. And that's something that third party data can answer. And I touched on this with Dan earlier, but third party data is critical to everything we're gonna talk about in this presentation and critical to all of the, this work that I mentioned the Fortune 500 companies are doing. And that is massive data sets um, of aggregated consumer data. Um, third party data is defined as data that's collected from entities that, that don't have a direct relationship with the person they're collecting that data on. So think about when um, you fill out your census data or um, you fill out warranty forms, um, you subscribe to different publications or different magazines, um, you fill out surveys, um, your, your social media activity, um, website activity. All of that, or, or a large portion of that is collected. Um, a lot of it is public domain and it's aggregated. So brought together, all at the individual and household level. And by individual and household level, I mean me, Jessica Akinwali, again at 100 Main Street, um, and my household. So it would have me, my husband, my children, everyone tied to this, this individual household record. Um, there, there are data aggregators such as Axiom, Experian, um, TransUnion, and, and then other um, resellers or analytics companies that leverage that data, um, such as myself with track data. You might, you might recognize Axiom, Experian, TransUnion as credit bureaus, um, you know, where you, you research your credit score, you request your credit information from them. Yes, they, they are that, but these businesses all have very large, very substantial marketing data sides of their businesses, where they, again, aggregate all of this disparate information um, tied to individuals and then sell it to 
uh, analytics groups and companies like myself or, or the, end, the marketer um, who's actually doing the advertising. So this, in theory, is what third-party data is, but what does it actually look like um, and what does it actually include? So if you look at the left here, it includes things like demographics, um, again, at the individual and household level, behaviors, purchase habits, preferences in media and communication, interests, credit information, um, in market for data, in market for meaning, um, in market to purchase a new vehicle, um, in market for a vacation or a rental home, um, and more. There, there are literally thousands of data points tied to each household and person record. Here's an example on the right. So we, we, we were looking at that list of customers a few slides back and said, look, this, this furniture company has John Smith as a customer. Great, but, but who actually is John Smith? By matching John Smith, so name and address, to a third-party data file, look at everything this company um, or, or the marketing team now knows about him. They know, again, name and address. He's a 32-year-old male. There's four people who live in his household. One of those people are his wife, Mary, who's 33 years old. They have two kids, a two-year-old and a five-year-old. They own their home versus rent. Household income is about 110,000. They own two vehicles um, and the vehicle type and model. Uh, they purchase heavily with their credit card. They respond to direct mail advertising. Big city families, that's here in or quotations. That's an example of a persona. And a lot of these companies, again, like Axiom or Experian, uh, the third-party data aggregators, because they have so much data on each person, again, tied to the individual level, they go ahead and segment that out for marketers. So they create segments of like um, people, of like consumers, so that we can get a better understanding as to what's their actual personality? What, what are their, their lifestyle preferences? What do they do on the weekend? Um, and thousands, again, of data points go into this. Um, and you can really almost infer personality type um, it's, it's, we could, I could get very deep on that topic. Um, so anyone again, feel free to reach out separately. Um, but for him, for John Smith, he, he's in the big city family persona. So he likes diverse city centers and he likes art programs and events. Um, he hosts parties and, and family game night. Um, he's an extrovert. He cares what his, his friends and family think of him. And he likes American made products. Finally, he's a new mover. So he's recently purchased his home new mover data and pre-mover data um, for a lot of industries, as you can imagine, for, again, furniture, for refinance and mortgage officers. It's extremely valuable to know someone's either A, looking for a new home or, or just moved to a new home. Um, so that's something we, we see a lot of. So um, those two definitions, the direct-to-consumer business and the um, third-party data, what is it, what does it look like? That leads us into what really is an agenda here, um, which are the three direct-to-consumer marketing techniques that Fortune 500 businesses leverage um, almost with 100% coverage uh, and smaller businesses as well. So the first is analyze. Um, so understanding again, who your current customers are. There's nothing more valuable than the data a company has on their own customers and then using that data to understand who your customers are. Target, so number two, using that data from step one for um, identifying your best prospects, um, both offline, so for direct mail purposes, for measurement purposes, and online for online campaigns and online targeting. And three, activate. So again, taking that prospect list you've created uh, based on data and matching those people across all channels for activation. So number one, um, analyze. And the we, we touched on this again, Dan and I, at the beginning with the profile report or the profiling. But the first step, if you, again, have first-party data or otherwise known as a customer list or know who your customers are, the first and, and foremost thing to do is to access some sort of customer profile report. And these are branded differently depending on which data company or uh, direct marketing agency you work with. It could be a lookalike report, it could be a snapshot. Again, customer profile report is um, probably the most representative name for it. Um, and essentially what that is, is these companies take your list of customers, match them to that third-party data we spoke about. And what that does is it all of a sudden it enriches each person. So John Smith, Jessica Akinwali, 
each customer is all of a sudden enriched with thousands of data points um, describing who they are. What, what this customer profile report will do is it will then summarize 10, 20 key variables, um, such as these ones mentioned below, uh, for, for the brand. So the brand knows, okay, my customers look like X, Y, and Z um, as it relates to these data points. Let me show you an example to hopefully make that um, a bit clearer. So here, this is just um, taken out from one of the profile reports we did, just a screenshot. Um, these are the analyzed variables that were looked at. So again, let's say this is um, a furniture retailer, a direct to consumer furniture retailer. They sell online direct to their customers. And we looked at all of these different data points um, on the right tied to their current customer file. And, and then we summarized each of those data points for them. So I called out two examples um, that we found interesting and relevant. So the first is woman in the workplace. Um, woman in the workplace is a variable, um, again, on that third party data file that says that a woman in the household works, um, works out of the home, I should say, because women work inside and outside of the home. Um, hopefully there are some women on this call. Um, so, so this is for women who work outside of the home. Um, and you can see here, the, the orange box here, that is representative of the brand's customers. So this brand has a large portion of their current customers. What is this about? 60%, 65% of their current customers are women um, who are in the workplace, who work outside of the home. The same, um, to tell that this is a relevant variable, because again, what if, what if in the natural population, in the general population, 65% of people also work, or women also worked um, outside of the home? But then this really wouldn't be a predictive variable because it's just average. It's average along with the rest of society, right? What makes this a relevant variable for this brand is the fact that compared to gen pop, which is this green box here, in the general population, so if you selected 100 women in the general population, only about 30, 35% of them, guesstimating here, um, work in the workplace. Compared to the, the brand, if you pulled out 100 of their customers, 65% of them, or 65 of the 100, um, work outside of the home. So that's a predictive variable. It means there's an opportunity now for this, this furniture retailer to revise their messaging and revise their targeting to reflect the fact that a huge amount of their customers are women who work out of the home. Same thing for homeowners and versus renters. You can see here um, for owner, oh, it's for owner, um, about, what is this, 90, 95% even of their current customers own their own homes versus rent. Again, we know that's that's a significant variable or data point for them because only 70, 65, 70% of people in the general population, so non-customers um, own their own homes. So maybe there's an opportunity again for them here to revise their messaging, to reflect something about, um, you know, add value to the, to the home you love and own or something like that. I'm clearly not the creative person um, on the team. So, so that's, that's the um, a profile report. So to summarize, step one, learn who your customers actually are. You have a list of customers, but that doesn't tell you much beyond the fact that Jessica and John have purchased from you. Find out who Jessica and John actually are. Um, and more importantly, find out how, who all of your customers are and, and how they're best represented by some of those data points, that those key data points that we talked about. So output number one, again, is better talk to your current customers. Use that learning from the profile report to revise your messaging, both for customers and for prospects. Because again, if a message resonates with your current customers, it's more than likely gonna resonate with your prospects and it just it improves the, uh, the relevance that your messaging will have. Um, another example could be, uh, there's a variable related to again, buying American made products. So if this furniture retailer determined that a huge amount of their customers preferred American made and, and the furniture retailer manufactured in the US, what a great message to put to put onto their creative saying, you know, made in the US, um, you know that will then resonate with, with potential prospects. Um, finally, identify new opportunities. So like I mentioned with the, um, with the creative options, if the brand didn't know that 70% of their customers were women in the workplace, they've now identified both the messaging opportunity and a targeting opportunity um, to find more, more prospects.
That leads us to step two. And if you do anything, step one's probably the most critical. That's where you should start. You should learn who your customers are because as you can tell, that data is just so valuable and will emanate through the rest of your business. Um, but step two now is target. So take that information that you just learned about your customers and apply it at a minimum to what you're currently doing on social media. I call out social media just because it's so prevalent among all brands, big and small. Um, better yet, step number two or option number two here, apply those learnings to create an offline prospect file. That is the prospect file Dan and I spoke about at the beginning. Um, the offline name and address prospects who have been targeted based on all of those same data points that were in the profile. Um, and option three, this is what a majority, um, if not all of the Fortune 500 clients we work with are doing. And that is creating that custom predictive model that Dan and I touched on. Um, I'll dig more into each of these three options. But the key theme here is no more spray and pray that you see down at the bottom in bold. And spray and pray, um, you've probably heard of that, that people throw that around. Um, it's essentially, you know, throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks. So, you know, you want to target women, let's just hit all women with our advertising or our messaging and see which one of them's raised their hand and show themselves as interested in the brand or, or likely to buy. There, there's definitely a more targeted way to do so. Um, which will improve your marketing results and outcomes. So this hopefully will be a visual, we'll see that will better describe those three options I spoke about on the last page. Um, so the, the first thing that you should do after you get your profile report, after you learn about who your customers are, again, let's go back to the furniture retailer as an example. So they determined that um, females um, or, or their clients were mostly female, um, they had kids, they um, had a higher household income and they were all college plus educated. Um, within social media, you can, if the, if the brand was running social media, they could go in and directly add these targeting filters uh, within let's say Facebook. So sort of instantaneously an output from that, that customer report uh, would be their ability to further refine their Facebook targeting, which again means instead of hitting everyone, in, in their target zip codes or target area. Now they're just focusing on these women here with the purple dots on them. So again, the, the women who have kids, who have a higher household income and are, are, have further education. Step or option two, offline list creation. This takes that, that prospect list development a step further in terms of targeting, because now you can use all of those same data points that were in the profile report you can use those exact same uh, variables for selecting a prospect list. So again, you work with a uh, data aggregator, so Experian, Axiom directly, or more likely a uh, direct marketing agency or, or a data partner and say, okay, I now know that my prospects are female, they're married, there's presence of kids in the household. I know that on average, my best customers have kids who are specifically two to six years old. Um, their household income is very specifically 75 to 110,000. They're college graduates. They're again, women in the workplace and they own their own homes. So you can purchase um, a list of prospects who fit those exact targeting criteria that you identified um, in the profile report. Again, here that list will be name and address. Um, and we'll get to later what you can do with that list. Um, but the key thing here is you can see it's more targeted. So step one, it's still great. It's much better than just hitting everyone or hitting all females. Step two gets a bit more refined. You're now hitting people who, or you're filtering for, for women who um, fit the exact variables or data points that represent your current customers. Option three here, this is that custom modeled list or the predictive model um, that again, Dan and I spoke about at the beginning. So this is where you, the brand's done their profile report. Um, they know exactly what their customers look like and who's most likely to be a customer or customers most likely to, again, be female, married, all, all of these data points here you see in number two. What a model will do though, is it will go beyond the data in the profile report. It will go beyond anything that you and I or the client could guess about their prospect, right? Because at the end of the day, I, I can, Again, let's say it's a furniture retailer. I can, based on gut, um, 
guess what variables would be predictive of that uh, of, of a customer again based on what they're selling and based on how they're positioning and based on if their websites um maybe uh, targeted towards women um again i'm not the creative person but i'd be able to go within the data available and say okay yeah i think it will be women in the workplace or yeah i think it will be um x y and z i think they're going to like social media but a model will go through each one of those thousand data points I mentioned that are available per person. And it will on its own using, again, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of those um, high tech uh, data targeting that's currently available. And it will actually measure each of those individual data points on closeness of fit. That's a lot of words that basically say that the model will tell us statistically, who are the best possible prospects for this brand? Not only will it identify those prospects, but it will score them or rank them literally from one, two, three, four, all the way down to 300 million or the total available adults in the US. Um, it will rank every single one in terms of how likely they are to respond or to engage and respond to this campaign. This list is longer because the model was able to identify, sorry, the model was able to see, you know, with, without based on gut, without based on the profile report findings, other variables that were predictive of their current customers. It was able to tell that uh, the best prospect is someone who cares about their friends' opinions. Again, like the uh, John we looked at at the beginning, it's someone who's willing to try new things. It's someone who prefers social media and direct mail. Um, they're an extrovert, they're social. Um, and that is the gold standard that again, if you receive an ad from Tide, it's because you've been modeled to receive the ad from Tide. Um, so. That is definitely the way Fortune 500 companies are, are targeting consumers. To summarize, and then um, there, there's one more section, then I'll go through a summary of this, how a company actually applied all of these steps, which I think will, will help. Um, but again, to summarize for, for the targeting section, we already know who our customers are. We did that during the analysis. Now we can apply those learnings from the analysis to social media campaigns. We can go outside of social media to target people, um, names and addresses of prospects based on the learnings from the profile report. And we can go beyond that um, to, to even model for best prospects. Regardless of which of these options you take, even if it's just improving your social media targeting, um, better targeting equals more people who are qualified being exposed to your ad, which will increase conversion and ROI. Um, so again, the better data that's in, the better results that, out, that, that will come out. Last but not least, um, part three, which is activate. So this is bringing everything together. Learnings from part one, target list from part two. Now we need to actually execute and expose these people to, to the brand's creative and the messaging that you've designed for them. We can do this um, via something called omni-channel marketing, multi-channel marketing. Um, that is essentially finding that individual prospect um, this woman right here in the middle, um, finding that individual prospect that you've identified across all the different channel options that are out there. So again, instead of targeting within Facebook, um, then separately targeting for your um, Google AdWords campaign or whatever it is, and then separately targeting for, um, let's say you do a postcard direct to home and you acquire a list to send a postcard, do all of your targeting once, identify your best prospects using those techniques that we just talked about and then match those specific prospects that you found across all of those channels. So now I know who Jane Smith's here, um, her address for direct mail. I know her email to do an email campaign to her. I know her mobile number to, to do a mobile uh, campaign to her. I know I can find her online across um, social media and across desktop programs. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially this is finding that individual person on a one-to-one -one level across all channels. What does that mean? Or what's the relevance of this? The relevance of this is it's been proven that um, the more you expose someone during a campaign period across different channels, the higher likelihood that that person will convert. So again, think if you've ever received a direct mail postcard, let's say it's for a window cleaning service. Um, you receive this postcard and you think, great, yeah, I need that done. I'm gonna save it away for when I need it done. And then, you know, a week later, two weeks later, a month later, 
you see an ad online, you're on Facebook and, and you see a message about this window cleaning, maybe the time's now right. Maybe that reminds you that you need to get that done. And without even connecting it back to that postcard, you're, you're already, um, you've been primed to, to receive that ad, to have it, to respond positively to it. And you click through and book your window cleaning. There, there are better examples for sure. Um, but that's an example of a multi-touch campaign. And we've seen ourselves directly and through just industry benchmarks, um, an, an average 35% lift when you do integrate channels in a single campaign. Meaning again, don't just do a Facebook campaign, don't just do a direct mail campaign, by doing multiple at the same time or multiple touches at the same time, um, you will see a significant improvement to response. Um, again, to, to summarize, um, with activation or with that part three, find those prospects everywhere and anywhere. And what that will allow you to do is either one, keep your budget the same. So don't increase your budget because you're now targeting, keep it the same, but you will see improved ROI because if you're exposing a hundred people to your message, instead of you know 20 of them being the right prospect, now 35 of them, 40 of them are the right prospect and your results are gonna improve. Um, or if you increase your budget, you'll, you'll be able to efficiently scale and you will significantly increase revenue from targeting, specifically just because of the data in your campaign. Because again, if you're targeting all women who are 25 to 35 for your, your online furniture retailer, um, and then you refine that to target all women who are 25 to 35 who have a new baby in the house who work outside of the home and who make $100,000 a year or more, or whatever the data points that we determined were predictive, you're tightening that audience um, to focus on more women who are most likely to buy. Um, so if you can scale that, and, and even if your campaign gets bigger, if a higher percentage of people who you're targeting are people who are most likely to positively engage and respond, um, you will see increased revenue. Last, I believe this is the last slide and probably the most important because I'm going to talk about how a smaller client we worked with, a small business, a single location, private school, was able to leverage these exact three steps um, that again, we, we work with much larger clients on, um, how they were able to apply these same techniques to see an improvement um, or, on their, or meet or exceed their goals. So the goal of the school was to drive more qualified prospects to their open houses to increase new family registration. So they were gonna host an open house to again, hopefully increase um, the student population. And they wanted an efficient way, um, or an efficient way to execute a campaign to, to fill those seats uh, with qualified prospects. So we started with number one, analyze. We took their current families, um, matched them to third party data and gave them or generated a profile report. And in that profile report, they were then able to see uh, what a representation of their current families looked like. So again, who, who are they? What do they actually enjoy doing? Where do they consume their media or their advertising, um, et cetera, et cetera. Step two, use those insights to identify a prospect list of most likely parents. So families who are most likely to go to that open house and sign up for the school or convert. Um, we created this not with the predictive model, um, so not with that third option. We created this list using that second option, if you remember, which was take the learnings from the customer profile report and acquire a filtered list um, of prospects who fit those requirements. So in their case, um, this filtered list included five to eight requirements, um, including zip code or including be living within the required zip code for the school. Um, include presence of kids, specific ages of the kids, um, income of the family, so family household income, again, location and some other data points. Interestingly enough, um, it also include the education level of both parents. That was identified in the um, profile report as something that was predictive of current families. And it's something that we wouldn't have guessed based on um, gut, again, if we were going out to build them a list on Facebook or wherever else, um, this was some, a unique insight that they were only able to learn because of the profile report. We then took that list of names and addresses um, and over here to step three, we were able to send a um, direct mail offer 
or invitation to those families to invite them to the open house at the school, um, as well as we ran a Facebook campaign during uh, the same campaign period. So before they received the direct mail offer, during the period it was mailed um, and then post for two weeks after they received the direct mail invitation, we ran a social media campaign specific to those families. Um, again, so from a budgeting perspective, um, we were able to just expose um, the people who received the direct mail offer to people on Facebook uh, or, or to the campaign on Facebook. And this resulted in them seeing one and a half times more open house attendees um, and 30% more new families registered compared to previous years. Um, and this is a result of, again, just better data in, better insights, better targeting, um, better results um, out. So that, um, that concludes the presentation part of it. I would love questions, Dan, from you or anyone else. Um, and I hope that was succinct but clear enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, you did a great job. Thank you. Um, so can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Perfect. All right. So I had a couple questions that I wanted to ask. Um, the first one is, um, you know, audience insights, which is the Facebook tool is actually going away at the end of the day today, starting July 1, that uh, audience, free audience discovery tool where you could begin to build kind of profiles based on you know, one interest category and see others. What are some other great free tools that you would recommend that can help you get a sense of some of the psychographics of your ideal customer and what their other interests are? That is such a good question. And I, um, frankly, I, I didn't know it was going away on Facebook because I always start from, again, the third party data and then match that into Facebook. So it removed the need for brands to use the Facebook tool for the insights because we were able to tell them um, what, what these prospects looked like. So um, I don't know if I'm able to send you something after, but I would love to look into that um, and send to you for all the participants here, something that might replace that. Um, it's not a free tool, but what I can say now is these profile reports are, are not, I'm talking a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars. Like it's not an expensive thing to do um, if that Facebook tool is going away. Yeah, it's, it was a great teaching tool, and um, I think it's related to the changes with iOS, and maybe they just didn't feel as secure that the data was accurate. Uh, and it sounds also like uh, the big brands uh, weren't using it as much. It was really much more of a service that was being used by the smaller businesses. Yeah. Um, and so... It isn't right. Uh, yeah, which is too bad. But I, I, I want to try to find an, uh, a great alternative teaching mm -hmm. tool. Uh, I know Google offers some. There's Answer the Public. But if you're able to ask your buddies and let us know if, if someone's looking for kind of a, an audience discovery tool. Um, you know, we talk a lot in our, uh, in our training programs about psychographic targeting and how Facebook is really amazing at that. And, and really what you're describing uh, as kind of what third-party data is allow, uh, able, uh, allowing you to do in the predictive model is really psychographic targeting. What are people's likes and interests based on the other factors, their behaviors, their demographics, mm -hmm. uh, their geography. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to kind of put that into context. Now, I wanted to give you a very common use case. Uh, so I'm working with um, a client who has a who has historically seen that this one type of person uh, who belongs to an association uh, tends to be a great customer for them. So they got the list of all the people in that association, right? And it includes, you know, first name, last name, email address, phone number, sometimes the address. What would you recommend? And this isn't uncommon. You know, a lot of us have like a prospect list like that. What do you do next? in an example specifically like that, where you have kind of an incomplete database, but you know they're your ideal customer. It's not really segmented, so you don't really know who's who inside of it. What, what would be, it's not a, you, you said in the first step, it was a customer list. This is a, a prospect list, but they are your ideal customer. They are someone who you think would really benefit from. What, what, what could a company like that do? Let me ask you one follow-up question, because there's a few different ways we could approach that does the company know who their customers are? So they have this prospect association list. Do they also know who their, their customers are separate from the prospect list or the association list? 
So w which of the association folks uh, are also customers? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Amazing, that's the best possible answer because what we could do is, first of all, clean up. I'd recommend they clean up um, that, that association list. So you can do that by matching it again to third-party data. There's something called a CAS standardization, which is essentially um, cleaning the data and filling any holes via USPS. Um, mail data. So we'd be able to fill all the holes in that, uh, complete any incomplete data um, to start off with, but then also enrich all of those people with the third party data variables. Um, when we do that, or when, when the brand does that, they'll be able to see, okay, um, here are the 10,000 association members. I don't necessarily have the budget or the means or want to target all 10,000 association members. I want to find the best 1,000 who are most likely to convert and I want to put all my time and all my resources into prospecting to those 1,000 best um, association members. They can look at what differentiates or what, how do the current customers look on that list compared to everyone else? So if the current customers on that list um, have, have certain, uh, certain income or live in a certain place or um, anything else, uh, any, anything else, any other that third party that we have, they can then say, okay, so our customers fit X, Y, and Z requirements. Let me go target everyone else in the association list who also fits X, Y, and Z requirements. So it's gonna allow them to tighten up who they should be focusing on within that association list um, by, by comparing it to current customers and seeing, okay, so who of these association members most look like my current customers? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very helpful. And I, I guess in addition to that, um, are, are, do you recommend that they would append other data to it, like other, you know, so that it's not just name, email address, but also lots of other factors as well? Definitely. And it doesn't have to be the thousand data points available because that's overwhelming even for the most sophisticated analytics teams, right? It can just be maybe 10 or 20 key variables. So again, demographic variables, um, they'll already have address, but things like, again, um, income, presence of kids, family makeup, household makeup, um, ownership type, et cetera. Um, get some of those appended and anything else that might be relevant on that list. Occupation is something else that's available with third-party data. Get those 10 or 20 key variables matched to the list, um, and then they'll be able to analyze themselves, um, both in terms of who they should be talking to, but also what, what message they should use with those people. Perfect. Um, we have a question from Andre. Would it be possible to collect data about the size and weight of a person? Ooh, great question. And you're <laughs> infringing on, uh, not, not yet, but it's getting close to that, that HIPAA. Um, there's, there's a lot of different um, regulations as it ties to anything that might be considered health data. Um, so we can't specifically get size and weight um, of a person. Uh, but there are definitely ways around that. For example, we have, um, or I've seen on, on the Axiom file, which is one of the third-party data files, um, interest in weight loss tools, um, if that's what you're going after here, or interest in other uh, programs as it relates to uh, weight loss or obesity. Um, there are a lot of data points, again, as it relates to um, that, that health and specifically weight loss industry. So no, you can't get the specific um, body composition of each individual person, but you can definitely target in on the people who would be interested in um, whatever it is you're, you're trying to talk to them about. Yeah, and there might even be other indicators that show the kind of signal what their weight is or their body type is. Um, so I think the, the one last question I wanted to ask before we wrap up is right now, Apple and Facebook are having a giant PR war about the topic we're talking today, which is privacy. Uh, Apple is positioning itself um, somewhat hypocritically as being, um, you know, the defender of our privacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Facebook, who's been kind of abhorrently cavalier with our private data, mm -hmm. is, is sees their business model threatened. Um, I don't think there, frankly, are good players in this, but I do think the debate is a real one. And frankly, Apple is very savvily using it for PR and to, to mm -hmm. kind of uh, bolster their brand. But I don't believe either of them. I don't think either of them are good actors uh, necessarily. 
So my question to you is someone who's a data scientist and who works in marketing data to leverage it for targeted advertising uh, and, and targeting, where do you stand um, as a company and as an individual uh, in this debate? Great question, because as a company and individual, I, I, I have different answers depending on if I'm answering as a company or an individual. Um, from a company perspective, look at if frankly, if cook, you know, if Apple gets rid of all cookies, if, if Facebook isn't able to do what they're currently doing, it doesn't actually, it doesn't much make a difference to the, the third party data business model. If anything, it, it gives us a boost or players in my space a boost because we're able to do all of the tracking, targeting without the use of cookies, um, which is again, the, the tool I spoke about at the start of this call, um, which is where we identify previously anonymous website visitors, match them back to PII. So meaning personal information, first name, last name. Um, it completely gets rid of the need for cookies and some of the things that they're, they're arguing about. Um, uh, look, I think what Facebook's done and what they allow to do from a personal level um, creates issues in that, uh, you know, some of the misinformation and everything that they're allowed to target so, so effectively because they have data on, on everything. We have to remember that Facebook doesn't just collect data when you're on the Facebook platform. It collects data from what you do through all of your internet activity. So again, just be cognizant of the fact that when you're, you're browsing outside of Facebook, Facebook's collecting and aggregating and um, applying science to, to everything you're doing um, online. And I'm going a bit off topic here, Dan, but I want to finish by saying there, there's a movie on or documentary on Netflix. Um, I think it's called The Great Hack. I'm pretty sure it's called that. Um, and, and it's talking about Facebook's role um, in the 2016 election and politics aside, far aside, um, what the documentary focuses on is the data that they were able to leverage and how they were able to hyper and micro target individual people with specific messages. Um, it's just incredible. And I think it really gives uh, an eye opening um, or it provides everyone with an eye opening. Oh, I see someone here says the social dilemma. Perfect. Yes. Um, those documentaries to, to what is out there, what these companies are using uh, to target you. And just remember that. There are companies that target positively. Again, I don't think I'm adding to the world, but I'm not taking away from the world by targeting, putting Tide Pods in people's hands who are most likely to like to buy a Tide Pod, right? It's, it's neither here nor there. But, but this data can be leveraged um, for good and for bad. So just wanted to throw that out there because it's very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. those documentaries. And, and without a doubt, mm -hmm. Apple is using these techniques and the data mm -hmm. they've collected to market. Mm -hmm. So really, they're just scoring some points off of Facebook and kicking a big guy when he's down. I, I got to say, I don't mind it. Uh, it, it is, um, you know, these big five um, uh, usually win uh, and, and Facebook is struggling right now. Um, so thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for that very uh, nuanced answer and honest answer. And, um, and, and thank you for taking the time uh, to present. You know, it's really with particular joy that I present a, an amazing female entrepreneur. Um, you know, we, about 70% of the people who go through our program are, are, are women business owners and female entrepreneurs and, you know, power to you. Um, how's it going? I know we're uh, about two years in. Yeah, no, great. I mean, we had a very um, cushy start to, to running our own business versus my co-founder who is the data scientist. So I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not a data scientist. I've just worked very, very closely with data and have learned enough to be dangerous, as he likes to say, um, over the years. Um, but it's been very cushy in that we, we did have a lot of um, clients kind of follow us and work with us, um, which has been, been great. Um, COVID, though, I, I've watched a few of your, your talks where you're talking about that, definitely hit hard. Um, but we were able to build out this targeted or this automated technology now, and now we're just able to scale so much faster. Um, and work with smaller businesses. Like I hope a lot of these uh, participants are um, because it's just it's just such a joy to work with smaller businesses, be able to bring the targeting techniques that we were using manually with larger businesses um, to smaller businesses um, and be able to see the sort of impactful um, or how much of an impact the, the increase in revenue and the, the better return on advertising spend has for the smaller businesses. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's the joy uh, working with the small business is that you get to actually uh, change lives in a way that's much harder to do uh, with with the big brands. Um, just a couple of quick things before we wrap up uh, the 58th BizHack Live and the end of season three. Uh, first of all, I did want to encourage you guys to please, please fill out the survey if you haven't yet. Help us to decide what season four will look like. Uh, you can get um, enter into a drawing to win an Amazon gift card. And then we had two other big announcements. We're going to be launching on September 14th, a course specifically designed for B2B marketers on LinkedIn with the amazing Cheryl Cattell. Uh, that's the five weeks. Uh, it's a it's a five week accelerated course, and it's specifically focused on how to get your profile in great shape and then to start doing content marketing that's going to attract the ideal customer. The other thing I wanted to share as kind of a kicker is we uh, recently learned that we are a finalist for a national award for cause marketing. And other finalists are ESPN, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Travelers Insurance. So we are so proud that, you know, among these, you know, massive companies, massive brands, you know, BizHack Academy um, is a finalist in one of the most competitive categories in the PR awards. And I wanted to give a hat tip to, to Lilia Posos um, and Wendy Poe for helping put together that application and, and Lilia for spearheading uh, our efforts. I'm so, so proud of this. This is amazing. Uh, we had won a global award from the AMA, uh, and now we're hopefully going to, uh, I mean, even just being a finalist in a category like this is, is so important and meaningful to us. Okay. So it's a, great, it's a great way to kind of uh, end season three. Lilia, I wanted to give you the floor to, to take us home. Thank you, uh, Lilia, for all that you've done to make this such a, a journey. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to all our speakers. This has been amazing, and like that news just came up before the session so it's a perfect way to to end this we will be coming back with a better experience for all of you guys this was the initiative that started uh, when COVID started we're step by step and slowly coming back to our regular and the new reality uh, so thank you for all the team thank you to all our speakers thank thank you for example Amy Williams Ruth and Smith they're still here so I love to see them coming and coming and we will be preparing more content for you guys. Thank you very much. So much more to come on BizHack Live and with BizHack Academy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. And again, Lilia, congratulations for uh, recognition well-deserved. Thank you both. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thanks, Adriana and Amy Williams and Andre and Cecilia, Gina, James, Marie, Michael, and Stacy for sticking, to it, sticking with us. And we'll see you soon. Have a great summer, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.